Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the 18th of 19 candidate forums for the 2021 general elections in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber of Commerce. I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Mr. Nelson Dilbert, vice president of the Chamber. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming Georgetown West candidates, Perlina Magor Lumsden, Elio Solomon, and Kenrick Webster, and thanking them for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Fellow candidate David White tendered his apologies. Your willingness to appear on this platform demonstrates to voters that you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions have been submitted via the survey, and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important to the Cayman Islands and the Georgetown West constituency. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an organization that supports, promotes, and protects the interest and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation, with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff, but would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Fosters, Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate, and DART. So a very big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM, for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time that we have live streamed the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to watch them in the comfort of their home. It is now time to begin this evening's forum. I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Mr. Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator. He will explain the rules of the forum and introduce the Georgetown West candidates. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So the rules for tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions, and you'll have two minutes to answer if you choose to do so. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption and is free to differ with an opinion or position of another candidate during your allotted response time. We're asking that each candidate deal solely with the issues and at the conclusion of each of the forum that each candidate will be allowed a two and a half minute closing statement. I'll now introduce the candidates for this evening. We'll begin with Perlina Magal Lumsden. Perlina is a graduate of the Cayman Islands High School and began her tertiary education with an associate's degree from the International College of the Cayman Islands and was later awarded a scholarship to pursue a bachelor's degree in accounting from Howard University in Washington, DC. Thereafter, she acquired a master's degree in law from Bristol University in the United Kingdom and a master's degree in sports management from Southern New Hampshire University. Over the course of her career, Mrs. McCall Lumsden worked in the financial services industry and also as a lecturer at the International College of the Cayman Islands for business law and general principles of law. She has also served as a board member for the Health Services Authority, the National Roads Authority, Information and Communications Technology Authority, Education Council, Scholarship Secretariat, Water Authority Cayman, and the Immigration Appeals Tribunal. Mrs. McGaw Lunsden is a board member of Generation Now, a youth empowerment program that provides, amongst other things, workshops on personal budgeting, scholarships, and professional development. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Elio Solomon served as a member of parliament between 2009 and 2013. During his time in office, he was responsible for numerous accomplishments, such as, but not limited to, pension withdrawal amendment 
that enabled persons to invest money from their pensions to acquire a piece of land, use as deposit for their mortgage, or pay off the balance of a mortgage. Mr. Solomon was also responsible for the construction of 87 affordable homes, the designation of certain categories of jobs for Comanions only amendment, and human organ and tissue transplantation law. Mr. Solomon has many years of experience within government, serving as technical support and procurement manager, including overseeing a staff of 17 in the Computer Services Department. He has done degree-level studies in electronic engineering, business administration, financial management, and labor economics. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Kenrick Webster was born in Georgetown and grew up in the community of Breakers in the district of Bodentown. He has three children and two grandchildren. He is actively involved in the Red Bay Primary School and attends the Savannah United Church. Mr. Webster graduated from the Cayman Islands High School in 1984 and was employed by the Cayman Islands Police Service. In 1990, Mr. Webster received the Commendation Award by the Commissioner of Police for his diligent work in solving the first bank robbery. During his final years at the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service, he opened his own business, Webster's Tours Limited, and focused his attention on the growth of the business. Mr. Webster has served on the Cayman Islands Government Public Transportation Board and served as a Director of Transportation for the Cayman Islands Tourism Association. He also supports many nonprofit organizations. He was awarded many scholarship sponsorships, has awarded many sponsorships for education, and continues to sponsor lunch program for children. In 2015, the CICA International University and Seminary conferred upon him the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Humane Letters, Honoris Cusia. In 2018, he was awarded the Paul Harris Award by the Rotary Club of Cayman Islands for his contribution to the Cayman Islands community. Welcome, candidates. Now, I've, now that I've introduced all of you, we're going to take a short commercial break. And when we begin, we'll begin tonight's forum with the first round of questions. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown West. I'll now turn over the first round of questions. We'll begin with President Mike Gibbs. Thank you, Will, and good evening once again, candidates. Uh, look forward to an evening of interesting discussion. Uh, the first question I will address to Ms. McGaw Lumsden, uh, and that is, what makes you the candidate of choice for the voters of Georgetown West? Thank you for the question, Mike. I think as um, most of you know, I actually come from a broken family. My mom is illiterate, she cannot read or write, and my father was an abusive individual. But one thing that my mother did was did not abandon her children. And so when it comes to the idea that we're thinking what makes a good choice for the people of Georgetown West, we have to think that the representative must not abandon the individuals that we call constituents. For me, when it comes to your candidate of choice, when it comes to Georgetown West, you have to think leadership. You have to think that the person heart must be in that job, in that responsibility. I'm not looking for a job when it comes to being a member of parliament. What I'm doing is, pas is my passion. What I'm doing is helping citizens of the Cayman Islands. What I'm doing is obviously offering 
my voice to amplify the concerns and the issues that need to be addressed in Georgetown West. In addition to that, I think we have to understand that Georgetown West is heavily unrepresented at this time. And that's the, one of the reasons why I'm running in Georgetown West, is to give better representation when it comes to Georgetown West. So I think with regards to leadership, when it comes to passion, when it comes to not abandoning the responsibilities that we have as an MP, is why they should make me the choice for Georgetown West. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question, please. Thank you very much again for the Chamber for hosting this particular program. In terms of Georgetown West, I would like to stress that one of my campaign meetings, I made it abundantly clear that when, a, when an individual makes a decision in terms of who they're going to vote for, it's a very serious decision. If you look at the representative that they have now, they have spent somewhere between $576 and $610,000 for that person to represent them. In doing all of my tours throughout Georgetown West, many people complain that they have not even seen the representative. And I can respectfully submit that he has done arguably nothing in the constituency as well. But you have paid a high price in terms of finances, and most importantly, you've paid a high price in terms of four years gone off your life. In particular, when I walk around Georgetown West and see that many of those persons are elderly individuals, the least thing that they can afford is to use or waste another four years of their life. And your decision is going to be a very important one. If you look at my background, I too come from a very disadvantaged area. I understand the issues. But not only do I understand the issues and make a promise that I can do something about it, I encourage you to look at my background. My background is someone who has been in office, who has the experience, and who has given the proven results of that. For example, as has been mentioned, I provided pensions for people to be able to withdraw money from their pensions to build a house, buy a house and pay off their mortgage. I built affordable homes, something that is seriously impacting my constituency, especially for the elder and for the young who needs homes and now you can't get it for less than 300,000. So if you're looking for a candidate that's not just making a promise to you, but at the end of the day has already proven to you that he can deliver, and I'm not jumping around, by the way, from constituency to constituency. I've dug into Georgetown West. This is my second run, and I'm there for the full course. Vote for someone who has the experience and the proven results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question, please. Thank you. I am running for um, Georgetown West, and I feel that I'm the selected candidate because I've seen the disparity between the have and the have-nots in our community. They have and the have-nots. Soon we'll have no have-nots in this country. Our young people are having challenges when it comes to getting a good education and employment. Therefore, I want to give them opportunities, and I also want to give them, most of all, hope. I have served as a member of the Royal Cayman Islands Police Force with distinction for approximately a decade. I am the owner and managing director of Webster's Tours, which have been in business for approximately 30 years. That um, give me the ability to serve our community by many sponsors that I've done within the community, sponsoring um, free transportation for bereaved families since 1999. I've also been sponsoring many lunch programs throughout the schools, over 40,000 composition books throughout the island, including Kim and Brack. I've been awarded the Paul Harris Award, as you heard earlier on, because of the tremendous amount of community work that I've done, um, only with, uh, not only with Rotary, but with the uh, Children and Family Services, by providing free transportation during the year for senior citizens, especially during the month of Senior Citizens Month in the month of October. I feel strongly that with my managerial experience of managing a, a team of 35 employees for the past uh, 30 plus years, I am capable, um, also with my experience in the Royal Cayman Islands Police Force, working alongside the Drug Enforcement Administration and also the um, Metro Dade Police Department and having law enforcement in maritime law. It gives me a wide experience, um, not only locally, but internationally. Um, I've seen where our community has many challenges. I want to meet those challenges. If I'm given the opportunity, um, by the people of Georgetown West, I will meet those challenges. You're looking for a candidate Thank that you, has Mr. demonstrated that they have actually done work in the community, and I've done that work in the past few years. Thank you. 
Good evening again, candidates. Good evening. Appreciate you coming. Um, the next question is going to be for Mr. Solomon. It's going to touch on some national issues. Keeping Cayman safe from COVID, the COVID virus and reopening the economy are among the top issues that will um, confront the next government. What other major issues or concerns do you intend to bring to the table for the new government to address? Well, I definitely believe that some of the major issues in my constituents, as well as national issues, has to deal with cost of living. Cost of living is a major one. And we also have to be able to provide jobs, and that in terms also equals a better jobs and we need to work on diversifying the economy and i definitely have plans to do that and i'm pretty sure that you'll probably be asking questions to help clarify some of those things but i have solutions for cost of living and i'll just throw some of those i think that when you look at housing housing is a major issue impact in this country we have at least 375 applications right now just for affordable homes young persons and the elderly in particular can't get into a home for less than 300,000. While I was in office, I constructed homes with a consortium of businesses that allowed two bedrooms to be built for 75,000 and three bedrooms to be built for 90. It can be done, and if I'm given the opportunity, I'll do just that. Things like diversification of the economy, I look forward to chatting with you about some of my ideas, for example, in terms of agriculture, because I really believe that when you look at the compendium of statistics, one of the, the third most expensive items is gonna be food on that agenda. And we have an opportunity, and I'm excited about it. If you think about being able to own farms in other countries like Jamaica and Honduras, and being able to know, one, you're providing additional jobs for Caymanians to be able to go over and manage those businesses, and to know that that is Cayman Islands property. I looked, and if you, if you don't like necessarily even Honduras and Jamaica, I looked even at Texas, 695 acres for $4 million. We have to think outside of the box. One of the things about the Cayman Islands has been that our, father, our forefathers went to sea, and that's how we made a living. That's how we put Cayman on the map. And the good word says, what is, has been, and what has been shall be again. I believe in the future. Our future is also going to be about going overseas and creating wonderful business opportunities for Cayman, and not just overdeveloping the Cayman Islands itself. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question. Thank you. Um, it's my intention um, to address the issues of the people of Georgetown West, but equally for the national issues, I think the most important national issues is addressing the health care, things that are giving us um, and causing an expense on the individuals within the island, not necessarily Georgetown West. So health care is the top of my list. Education is important. Education in all facets, because education brings about a holistic um, environment, um, reduces crime, it brings about awareness, and so it has different facets. So the education system is near and dear to my heart, so I want to make sure that the education system is improved. We've had, over the um, past 20 years, we've had many educators. We've had, um, we currently we still have educators within the system. We've even had the premier who has been in charge of the as charge of the education system, and nothing substantially has been done that you can say that there has been a success with education. I think it's about time that we owe our young people and the Cayman Islands a better future, a better pathway for success, and the only how we're gonna do that is to have responsible leadership, leadership that can manage um, the education system, that understands from the ground up, um, it's just like building a house. If you don't have the foundation correct, um, you're not going to get a, a finished product. You can change the roof, but you can't change the foundation. So it's important that we make sure that our young people are tested early to make sure that they have um, been identified for dyslexia and other um, physical challenges before they go through the system because the system currently is failing our young people, and I cannot afford to have that done and continue be done, to be done, especially in this 21st century, when we, as a community, have to be very competitive with not only with our destination, but in the international market. Thank you. Ms. McGaugh Lumsden, same question. There's so many issues and concerns that we are facing as a country. We're at a crossroads where everything is in a crisis, whether it's environmental crisis, cost of living crisis, housing crisis. But the thing that I would like to focus, or the issue of the concern I would like to focus on, is traffic congestion. And why traffic congestion? Because it obviously is impacting the quality of life that we live within the Cayman Islands. There's no reason or rationale why we, as a developing nation, 
is in a situation where we're encountering traffic congestion at the levels that we are in this society. And like I said, there's no reason also that individuals have to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning in order to get to school. What's that, what is that doing? Children have, now have to eat in their, in their parents' car, fall asleep, do their homeworks, do their homework. And so with the negative impacts that it's having with regards to quality of life, it's deteriorating the family structure. So that is something. Of course, we're going to ask, what are the solutions? The solutions are, do we have to implement a robust transportation system? Do we have to go to flex hours? Do we also have to speak and have dialogue with regards to the private sector to go to a three-day, two-day work day week? Because obviously, at the end of the day, it is about trying to alleviate and work with the private sector as much as possible to bring these issues and solutions pertaining to these issues. But also, like my um, opponent has said, housing is a, is, 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 um, is a major issue in the Cayman Islands. We have got to provide adequate housing, especially for young people who don't feel that they can actually own a piece of their own paradise. And what are the solutions for that? There's various different solutions. Do we have to acquire more crown land in order to provide housing for, for young persons? And obviously that's gonna be within their budget. So we have to look at that. Do we have to have private and public sector dialogue with developers? Absolutely we do. Because what that's gonna do, if concessions are passed on to these private developers, we can then pass that on to young Caymanians who are, like I said, are just, is just trying to own a piece of paradise that belongs to you and me as Caymanians. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the third question, starting with Mr. Uh, Mr. Webster, and this will be focusing more on your constituency priorities. The question is, what are your plans or, I or ideas to improve Georgetown West for its residents? Georgetown West has many different issues, but the major concern for Georgetown West is in some areas, especially in the Windsor Park area, we have low-lying areas there, which requires drainage. I want to make sure that those areas that are in need of drainage, that they get this sufficient drainage in those areas. But importantly, the whole entire Georgetown West needs to be safe. Safety comes in three different parts. Safety with commuting. I want to make sure that the sidewalks that are the current sidewalks are upgraded. They have not been upgraded since they have been installed. There are some roadways that need additional sidewalks. I want to make sure that those sidewalks are a place for persons who go through and live there in Georgetown West and also people who commute to work within that vicinity. Lighting is another issue that part of um, safety. There's many areas of Georgetown West that needs um, lighting. That's important. Speed bumps. Speed bumps are necessary to be placed especially along Maple Road, some parts of Windsor Park. Because of the traffic congestion um, within the country, persons are diverting to avoid traffic in the mornings, especially in the mornings through these areas, and they're speeding at excessive speed. So to ensure that the safety of the people of Georgetown West, I want to make sure that we have speed bumps um, within those areas so that we can uh, reduce the amount of speed and keep the people in Georgetown West safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McGaw Lumsden, same question, please. I've had the privilege of actually canvassing and being in various different neighborhoods um, within Georgetown West. And probably the number one concern with regards to Georgetown West is flooding. And at the end of the day, we have to establish or try to ascertain a proper area drainage plan for Georgetown West. Once we ascertain that, we can then, the solution can then be, do we have to implement much more drains when it comes to Georgetown West? Do we have to increase the size with regards to the drains? Because as Kendrick has identified, we have low line areas, air areas in Georgetown West. And it's not just Windsor Park, it's the entire Georgetown West that is obviously encountering flooding. But in addition to that, in canvassing Georgetown West and in being involved in the neighborhood of Georgetown West, Another thing is that our elderly is heavily abandoned when it comes to health care and various different accessibilities when it comes to those individuals. So what I want to do and what I want to encourage is definitely how can we facilitate 
and make their lives, their quality of life, so much better than what they are. They are forgotten. Funny enough, I don't know how that has happened, considering that they have helped build this country. And so the emphasis must be on the elderly and the emphasis must be on the floodings. In addition to that, various different areas in Windsor Park are encountering speed speeding. And what that is doing is a number of kids are not able to go out like how we did and play in the neighborhood and have that bonding moments. And we need that. We need to bring that back into the neighborhood. And so I will also attempt to try to implement as much speed bumps as possible so that we can have that human interactions, so that young people can have so much good memories the way that we did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Yeah, I suppose I would take those things from the, the softer side or the human side and some of those things from the infrastructure. If I could start first of all with the infrastructure. I look at Georgetown West and I definitely see a lot of the sidewalks that needs to be fixed. Flooding is indeed an issue. And I would like to say that I have, a, I believe I have a solution for that because it was one of the things that I was actually involved with while I was actually in office also. I want to be able to see in Georgetown West beautiful bus stops. I want to have those that they're creating solar energy. People can charge their cell phones while waiting for transportation. And I want to be able to see that the roads are going to be properly paved. And as I've said, deal with flooding. In continuing on on the infrastructure, again, I talked about cost of living. There are so many people in that area right now that are having to contend with the cost of living issues, which again, primarily is housing. And we can deal with things like solar panels. Right now in this country, no solar panels will be able to be installed until 2022, simply because the government isn't living up to their obligations under the National Energy Plan. So we need to resolve those problems in terms of physical infrastructure, lower the cost of living for those persons. If I deal with more on some of those human sides, I've had to meet in canvassing, for example, just to give you one. A gentleman, 60 plus years of age, now paying 1200 plus for rent. That individual is not going to be, him and his wife will not be able to work much longer. Where are those people going to go? We need to be able to do exactly what I did while I was in office, build affordable homes that allows them to, at the minimum to transition into those homes and pay $600 a month to rent to own the home. We need to do that as a matter of priority. I see so many of our young persons down in there, particularly our males, who are, again are drinking, using drugs. They need to have help. They need solutions. And at the same time, a lot of our young, young persons, both male and females, are trying to get jobs and they're simply being denied those opportunities. And this is one of the reasons why I was in office, even though it wasn't popular, to come up with jobs for Caymanians only. There are a myriad of jobs that are being sent overseas, and just those jobs coming back home would create wonderful opportunities for our people. Thank you. Okay, um, coming back to you, Ms. Magad Lumsden, uh, we're going to start. Our next topic is going to be on education. Education is critical to the success of our youth and our future. There is an increasing divide between the quality of education between public and private schools. What measures would you support to correct this imbalance? I don't want to so focus on private and public. We have an educational crisis, but I don't think it's curriculum per se. What I do think that needs to happen, Nelson, more than anything, is we have to understand why children are not learning in the public schools. That's the most important thing. And why are children? I come from a broken home. So when I attended school and I was hungry, I couldn't learn. And it's as simple as that. And I come from a, 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 broken, home, a broken home where my father was abusive, where my father was alcoholic. Am I supposed to then lend my attention to education? It's not a priority for me. And so what I think we need to understand is that we need to have social programs within the school to help with the children that are dealing, whether it's mental illness, illness dysfunctional, um, home, coming from dysfunctional homes, mental illness, um, going to school hungry and obviously cannot focus. Those are the social aspects that we have to um, try to focus on when it comes to children learning. It's extremely, extremely important. We tend to think that, oh, it's the curriculum. It's not the curriculum. I couldn't learn until I was actually in fifth form. I was a late bloomer because I simply could not concentrate. I simply could not lend my attention to education. Yes, it is a priority, but in order for it to be a priority, in order for us to actually f have kids focus and 
stress the importance of education. They have to come from a comfortable zone and a very stable environment in order for them to focus. So I think it's important that we focus on the social programs. But in addition to that, I think it's incumbent upon the government to ensure that we get qualified and quality teachers. That is important. They have within them passing the knowledge to our most valuable possession, our children. And, and so it's incumbent upon us that we ensure that they are qualified, that they have qu their quality, and then in turn, they're going to pass that education on to our young people. And that's what I think that needs to happen. Some people have suggested, should we reintegrate our, the, the schools? That happened when, of course, we were in high school. I'm not too sure that is the answer. Thank I, you. I, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely think that as I talked about the major issues being cost of living and those sort of things, one of the fundamental reasons why you have divorce and marital problems is because of finances. If there's a reason that family is going to break up, it's probably over finances. So when I can actually look right now in Georgetown West and see mother, father, uh, son, son's wife, grandchild living in the same house and facing financial challenges, we know that there's a problem. And you're going to have those issues. When I was younger, I remember having to go on the tenders, and I worked on those tenders, made money, and I used it to buy lunch. And all of those challenges and difficulties, hearing mom and dad argue about mortgages and bills, creates challenges for an individual to be able to learn in the home or learn in school. And again, fundamentally, that's why I think you need to address the whole issue of cost of living and diversifying the economy to create the proper environment for those students, children to be able to go to school and to be able to learn properly. To be able to address specifically your question, I definitely think that when we separated the schools, we, we created a major problem. Even when, when we were all together in that mixture, we gave us an opportunity to network. We understood other uh, individuals and where they were from and about their habits, about their culture. Those things disappeared. In addition to that, when it transitioned from school to jobs, well, you had one, you had one group now that's networking <clears throat> and they, they, they're looking out for their buddies who they went to school with and vice versa. When those things were together, it was a lot different. And I think that there should be something working towards that reintegration as well. And I want to say that I think that we need to be able to create a different style of learning. We need a lot more mentorships going on because bottom line is not only is education more, ex most ex more expensive, but going to school, learning, and not being able to transition into a job is a complete waste of time. And if we can get more mentorship, mentorship going on, we can actually make that transition a lot easier when it comes to education. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question. Yes, with the education system, as I mentioned before, overall, for you to be successful with the system, you have to have proper management. The education council that has been put in place, I think they're doing a good job. But overall, we have to also have communication. What is lacking in the schools is the lack of communication, because we do have some social issues within our community. Whenever the councillors would go out to those particular homes, it's not communicated with the teachers. So the teachers do not understand what is happening within the schools, what is happening with those individuals. So there's a disconnect there. We need to make sure that that is addressed. We need to have proper communication, integration with um, some of the persons who are not from here into public schools. I think we need to look on that. We used to do that many years ago. We can go back to that system. but to ensure that our young people are successful. We need to have system, systems in place. Teachers need to be qualified for the particular area that they're working in. For example, if you're gonna have someone in KG, kindergartens, those specialties have to be identified for that particular teacher that they can be successful uh, with those children because the children are with those persons, with those teachers, eight, nine hours a day. So we have to make sure that we get the qualified teachers that can identify the, when persons, when those children are having challenges, when they are having challenges with physical challenges, also when they're, there are certain things that you can see when a person is challenged with identifying if they have dyslexia, whether or not they have ADHD, and that is the time where those persons need to be channeled um, to get the proper testing. The system, as I mentioned before, is failing because they're not tested in an early stage. And then eventually what tends to happen is that they do not get.
the correct amount of time allocated to them for, to do their examinations. Equally, we have a situation where um, we don't have career guidance into our schools, and that's a major, major problem for us. Thank you. For the, uh, the fifth question, which will be the last one in this first round, um, to you, Mr. Solomon, focuses on Northwood Prison. In 2019, the Human Rights Commission described the prison as overcrowded, chronically underfunded, and in need of urgent investment. They said the plans to examine the needs of the prison system and the upgrades to the physical infrastructure are moving far too slowly. What is your view on these statements? Well, I, I definitely think that there's a... I've had an opportunity to, to actually visit the prison on several occasions, and I, I will stress that one of the things I actually did for the prison was there used to be a remand service that you had to trek every Friday to carry the prisoners from the prison to the courts. One of the things I actually constructed was two cubicles there with all of the relevant cameras and technologies so that those prisoners could stand in the cubicle and actually the courts could actually see them while they were there. And that, amongst other things, avoided a lot of trekking and it lowered costs of at least $2.8 million for the government. But there is an overcrowding issue, and infrastructure and money has to be spent to be able to try to rectify that problem. I think everybody knows what overcrowding causes in a prison. I, I recall very vividly, almost like yesterday, when an individual was murdered in the prison simply because of overcrowding. And I think that this government, and again, they have been in office for two terms, so it shouldn't be a continuity issue, has clearly neglected it. You can talk about all the surpluses that you have in the world, but if you're sitting there and neglecting your people, whether it's prison, or elderly or youth, then it's all come to naught. So definitely it needs that sort of support. And I also want to say that we need to, de to decide that prison is simply not a place to lock people away and forget it. At some point in time, at least hopefully the majority of them are going to find their way back into society. And they need to be provided with the proper skills and training, both in terms of the technical skills as well as the social skills to be able to reintegrate back into society. Failing to do that, we'll fail the, the entire country. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question, please. I agree that the prison has been overcrowded for many years. When the prison was first built, um, it has been very uh, uh, little expansion done to it. Um, overcrowding, the pandemic can show definitely by not having the system being expanded, what challenges that they were facing during COVID-19. I would support making sure that the prison get the proper expansion, but the programs that are necessary for the prison is important. We have to look on the type of jobs that are available into our market. We have to upskill the prisoners. We have to have a system that are done in tiers. For example, you'll have like category one, which could be for um, prisoners who have serious offenses, and they can be translated into the community as far as being entrepreneurs, but you would have to give them incentives. You would have to have the programs available for them so they can start the programs within the prison. So by the time that they transition, they can be integrated back into society. One of the things is that the prison is being used as a revolving door because of the return of these prisoners. And that is why we also have an overcrowding into the prison. So if we can reduce that by having the necessary programs within the prison system, we would alleviate the crowding and we would also bring about a better environment for the Cayman Islands by having these prisoners uh, reintegrated. It would assist the families of those persons who are, have been incarcerated and give them and their children and their families hope. Thank you. Ms. McGowan. Well, I agree with the statement. Let's face it, at the end of the day, the majority of prisoners have minor offenses. And with those minor offenses, offenses, what we need to think about is how do we re rehabilitate prisoners? And how do we actually have them reintegrated into our society? Because what's happening is that these criminals go out in society and because they can't make a living, that's the issue. They cannot get a license, a trade business license, hypothetically speaking, just to obviously own their business, a car wash business, because they have that criminal offense on their record. And so what, what happens? If I can't get a job, if I can't own my own business, 
what am I going to do? I'm going to create and do and have and do another offense or reconvict recon myself again. And therefore, that is what's causing the overcrowded in 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 um in in the in the prison system. So I think what we need to focus um, on more than anything is definitely rehabilitation and definitely removing some of the criminal convictions on these individuals' records so that we can actually upskill them, we can train them and have them be part of society and actually what that's going to actually be more than an asset to the society and that is what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Gone through the first round of questions. When we return after this break, we'll begin the second round. Please stay tuned. Feed the family for less with Foster's Pick 5. Choose from a range of meats including chicken thighs, pork chops, ground meats, beef stir fry, sirloin steaks, and more. And only pay $19.99 for any five packs. The meat is always fresh and never previously frozen. It's the perfect way to stock up for the week. That's dinner sorted. Look out for Pick 5 in the meat department at all Foster's supermarket locations. Foster's. Better value because we care. You hear people talk about the economy all the time, but what is the economy exactly? The economy is the flow of money between the people, the companies, and the government in the Cayman Islands. Why is it important to understand the economy? Well, just like the engine of a car, the better we understand the economy, the better we can make it run, and the more prosperous we can become as a community. The first important thing to understand about the economy is that the private sector is the main source of all wealth. Think about it. Most people work for companies in the private sector, both big companies and small businesses. But even if you work for the government, your salary comes from the fees and duties paid to the government by private sector companies and their employees. That's why we call the private sector the prosperity engine that powers our economy and drives the country forward. When business is booming, companies have more money to spend on salaries, bonuses, and promotions. Employees with more money buy more products and services from other businesses. All those people and businesses spending money generates revenue for the government, which pays for important services like education, roads, emergency services, and care for the elderly. So when the private sector is doing well, everyone does well. But when the private sector isn't doing well, like during a recession, the money dries up and everyone suffers. So when you hear people ask, how do we make our country more prosperous? The answer is pretty simple. Grow the economy. After all, you can't get more money from a system that isn't making more money. That's not economics. That's just common sense. In this video series, we're going to take a closer look at our economy to see how we can fuel our prosperity engine and how to make sure everyone benefits. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Here in the Cayman Islands, the private sector is the prosperity engine that drives the country forward. Just like a real engine. The better we understand how it works, the better we can make it run, and the better off we'll be. To help illustrate how our economy works, let's take a step back in time to when there were only a few thousand people living in Cayman. In those days, most people survived by fishing or farming for food. It was a simple, wholesome life, but it was a lot of hard work. Most people bought what they needed from their neighbors. As people bought and sold things, their individual wealth went up or down. But the overall wealth of the country stayed the same. In a simple economy like this, the only way one person could increase their wealth was by reducing someone else's. In order to increase the overall wealth of the country, one of our Caymanian ancestors would have to sell something, a product or service, to someone somewhere else and bring that money back home. In other words, we would have to export something. In those days, our biggest export was labor. Men worked overseas or on the seas and brought the money home, thereby increasing the total wealth of the country. Although the economy is much bigger and more complex today, these same principles still apply. 
Every time a company in Cayman sells a product or service to a customer overseas, the overall wealth of the country increases. Once it's here, it flows around the local economy between the government, the people, and the companies, and becomes a part of our society's wealth. The two biggest sources of income for our economy today are financial services and tourism, often called the pillars of our economy. Tourists come here and spend their money. So all of the tourism companies like hotels, restaurants, buses, Stingray City Tours that make sure our visitors have a great time are helping to increase the wealth of our country. Just like tourists, clients of financial services firms come here and spend money too. So all of our financial service companies like insurance companies, fund administrators, lawyers and accountants that facilitate investment transactions for people and companies around the world bring money into the economy and increase the overall wealth. The point is, if we want to increase the prosperity of our country, the best way to do that, in fact, the only way to do that, is to grow the private sector. In particular, the companies at the front lines that bring the wealth here from overseas in the first place. In the next video, we'll talk a little about how money moves around the economy. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown West. Finished the first round of questions. We're going to begin the second. And to pose the first question, we'll turn it over to Chamber Vice President Nelson Dilbert. Thank you, Will. Um, we're going to start with you, Mr. Webster. Um, this is going to be on growth management. We keep hearing about the increase of population to 100,000 and further development. Do you support this continued development? And what measures would you recommend so that Caymanians benefit from a growing economy while at the same time balancing environmental concerns? I do not um, support the um, expedience of a 100,000 um, population persons to um, bring up our population. I think that is not responsible. I think we need to make sure that we have a comprehensive plan before we try to push too many people within the country because we're going to have situations on our infrastructure that cannot maintain and support that amount of people. Right now, we're experiencing many issues, especially with traffic. We're experiencing issues with affordable housing. We have other health care issues that we're um, having problems with. So just imagine the stress that that would put on our health care system alone, um, our education system, um, tertiary education. UCCI has not have a phase two um, facility since it has been constructed. So we have to look long term. So I think we need to get this right before we start pushing the amount of persons that we have. Again, the development um, and to balance the environment that goes hand in hand. If you don't manage the product from day one, you're also going to have problems with the development um, damaging the environment. We need to identify with, through that plan, the comprehensive plan, areas that needs to be protected within that plan for our environment, wetlands, historic um, buildings, historic trees, historic and natural resources within that comprehensive plan before we start move into a major, major influx of more people to our society. So I think it's not responsible to do that at this time. And I would like to see um, a comprehensive development plan done before that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Ms. McGaugh Lumsden. Nelson, thank you for the question. I think if we could take a page out of dart book, we'll be in good, be good standing. And what I mean by that we have to plan, plan, plan. The first question that we need to ask ourselves and the government to actually ask themselves is, do we have a national policy in place similar to Vision 2008? Once we have that plan in place, we can then identify what infrastructures are required. Even if it's on a yearly basis, we need to have a plan in place. Once we have that, we can then identify how are we going to grow the economy? How are we going to grow when it comes to development? 
Schools are stretched as it is. Healthcare is stretched as it is. But if we have that um, national policy or national plan in place, it's going to allow us to better facilitate what is required. I am not in support of the growing the, the, um, the country to 100,000. Like I said, we're going to have enormous impacts when it comes to traffic congestion that we're dealing with already. We're going to have enormous impact on our healthcare system, on schooling. Um, I mean, it's just a number of things that just does not go. And I don't think that we should be thinking about growing our population to 100,000 people at this time. But what we do need first and foremost is to have a national policy plan in place so that we will know exactly what the intentions are with, for this country within the first the next year, the, in the first uh, next year, the next two years, or the next three years. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Same question. Well, first and foremost, I believe that whatever growth we have, whatever benefits we see as a country, it has to translate into benefits for our people. And unfortunately, right now, I think if anyone came to you and said that they were having difficulties building a two-bedroom house and couldn't manage that household. The last thing you want to do is give them an opportunity to build a nine-story a nine -story building. And I think that's the situation here. We came and get to a population of 100,000. Without a doubt, at some point in time, we will get there. But to be artificially working to inflate that, and you can't manage the problems that you have now, I don't, I don't think that's the right move. I remember being in office, and let's just understand this. If Hurricane Ivan, luckily it passed by and we didn't have any casualties, but if Hurricane Ivan had killed 100 or 2,000 people, and it was very possible. We would not have even had the place to bury the dead. And we did not even have the legislation that allowed the government to have a mass burial. There is such a, a gross lack of planning in this country that the last thing the government should be talking about is exacerbating the problem by adding more and more people to the population. We have Caymanians that are already falling behind the, between the cracks. Can't, as we mentioned, can't even get an affordable home. What the government has just done, and, and here's the irony of it, when I was asked to bring in the pension amendment that allowed people to invest in their country by owning a house and owning land, the now premier argued with me that that was irresponsible. Well, 3,000 families have benefited, and it's doing pretty well, but what they did with the pension dispensation, well, it might have helped some people, but I can tell you, it, has it is going to create a major problem and I can't, I can't stress it enough, it is going to be a major problem in the next couple of years just in terms of retirement. So I think we COVID-19 should do one thing. It should hopefully allow us to be able to say, you know what, let's take stock and let's see what we can do to tighten up this ship, get greater efficiencies and effectiveness of service. And do, do, am I a business person? Absolutely. I have wonderful ideas that I think we want business to grow, we want our people to grow. But if, at the end of the day, if we can't manage what we have now, Let's take stock and let's see if we can get that in order first before we try to go anywhere else. Thank you. Mr. McGill Lumsden, the next question is to you first. Uh, focuses on Georgetown West development. Would you support increasing the heights of buildings in Georgetown West to accommodate more multi story residential buildings? If yes, where would you position those buildings in the constituency? As you can tell, this is a specific question for the Georgetown West constituency that came from our forum. Uh, well, we see what has happened with Finn on the South Church Street. And so at this time, I can't say that I'm going to lend any support at all when it comes to increasing the heights of any building in Georgetown West. We have to be mindful exactly who are we developing for. We are over developing the Cayman Islands. And we, while we're over developing or while we're developing, one must take in consideration, is it sustainable development? And what do I mean by sustainable? Yes, we must continue to grow as a country, but not, as the, not at the cost of future generations. And that's as simple as I, can put it, as I can put it. And no, at this time, I do not encourage any increase in of the heights of buildings in Georgetown West. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. Well, I, I would have to say that, first of all, you know, I. I would, I would welcome the opportunity for a more empirical sort of survey to be conducted in Georgetown West. But I can tell you from canvassing that I do not believe the people of Georgetown West, either on the west or the east side, is in favor of any more construction of large high-rise buildings, et cetera. That's definitely the feedback that I'm getting. And if you actually look at uh, Georgetown West, 
there's all, uh, the entire Cayman Islands, probably, but Georgetown West, there's already inadequacy in terms of parking. So if you're going to talk about, you know, increasing the height of those buildings, which means you're having much more people stacked on top of each other, where are they going to be parking? You know, transportation is a major issue in this country. And I hope to be able to touch on that later on. But in, in short, in the absence of any empirical study and based on what I've canvassed and based on what I can see on the ground in terms of lack of resources, lack of parking, I don't support high-rise buildings in Georgetown West. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question, please. Thank you. I would agree that um, with the canvassing that I have had and the disgruntled persons that are within the community in respect to the Finn project, I think that's enough to say that I will not support any multi-story buildings in Georgetown West. When you're doing multi-story buildings, you also have to think about um, different, um, different factors. For example, it's like, you know, bring in something in an urban development and you got to think about where you're going to position that building, wind factors, you have to think about the safety with fire trucks and other emergency vehicles getting to that, those particular buildings in the event that there's something that happens. Again, it's going to um, also put a stress on the road infrastructure. Currently we have problems as it is with the uh, traffic, so that's going to bring even more traffic to the Georgetown West area. So I have to be a voice for the people of Georgetown West. And because I've seen and heard their plight about the problems that you're having with that particular one project, I don't want to encourage any more, and I will not encourage any more high-rise buildings in Georgetown West. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, this question is going to start off with you, Mr. Solomon. It's in um, regards to ministerial positions. Uh, if elected, which ministry or position in the gov new government would best suit your skills and why? Well, you know, <laughs> let me first of all say while I was in office, one of the things that I was able to create was the e-government board. So the first time the e-government board existed was, was on our watch. And I think that there was a lot of things that translated of benefits of, of that. One of the things I mentioned earlier on was the prison, and I, I shan't go into it anymore. But I say that because I definitely want to see a better Cayman Islands in terms of diversifying the economy and lowering the cost of living. I'm a person that believes, for example, that our pensions should be invested locally in terms of being able to build our infrastructure. And I think if we do it properly, we can maintain a proper portfolio that allows everybody to benefit from it, and especially our stakeholders, the Caymanian people. I want to see us, for example, by our water authority and have our Caymanians knowing that every time they turn on the top, they're going to benefit from that. And I think there's a myriad of different investments. I talked earlier on about things like agriculture. Again, I do not see a reason why we cannot go to Honduras and spend 10, 12, 25 million, whatever it takes, and buy hundreds of acres that has 5,000 heads of cattle on it and call that Cayman Islands property. I believe that we can do that. It's absolutely viable. And we have to think beyond just simply building more buildings in Cayman. We have to think out of the box. When you add up all of these things, I talked about housing, housing being an issue. So if you see where I'm going, I'd like to be a minister. Absolutely. I serve one term in office, and I believe I have the competency. And if I'm given the opportunity by the people of Georgetown West to be elected, and if I'm given an opportunity during the negotiation process to become a minister, I would like to be. I would like to be a minister with the responsibility for the pensions. I would like to have agriculture. Health is something that's also super important to me. And, of course, dealing with the issues of trade and e-government. And I know that that's a big, heavy plate. But I believe that I have a lot of the skills, the proven experience, and definitely the passion to make it happen, if given the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question. Thank you. When you're trying to make up a government, especially when you have independence and you can see what happened in the last election with the coalition, most times it's the individuals with power struggle. As a new candidate, if I'm given the opportunity, yes, I would take a ministry, but it's not all about power struggle. I just want to make sure that we have the right minds to make up that government, the right people that have the same philosoph philosophical ideas and have the country at heart and to give our people the first opportunities to make themselves better. My strengths, because I've had 
over 30 plus years in the tourism business with being recognized not only locally but internationally with um, great service um, as an ambassador within the travel industry and the cruise industry. I can position myself because I've been around a lot of the round tables through the Florida Caribbean Cruise Association conferences. I've also uh, been awarded on many years by the uh, Delta Vacations. Um, so with their Delta Vacation Universities, I have been around a lot of round tables. So I have the experience, I have the knowledge how to network in that capacity. And in another area would be planning and infrastructure. I'm a logistics person. As a young person, my uncle was a carpenter by trade and I've gained that skill and knowledge. And I understand what building is. I understand how important it is to build. I understand urban development. I understand infrastructure and how to place things in certain positions to ensure that not only that it's built right, but it's safe when you're building. So those two ministries would be something. But in addition to that, I would want to make sure that I keep a full scope on under the Ministry of um, Education because that is near and dear to my heart and I think we need to build our um, community with good educated people. Thank you. Ms. Uh, McGarv Lemson, same question please. I think first and foremost, I need to focus on just being elected. That's the first priority for me as a candidate for Georgetown West. And once I'm elected, my responsibility is definitely to ensure that people are taken care of. We must always put the people first. So as long as I can put the people first, and when it comes to my background, I'm pretty diverse. As you know, I have a bachelor's degree in accounting, I have a master's in law, and I have a master's in sports management. So if I did have to identify, would identify one Nelson that would best suit my qualifications and my skill set, I would definitely say community affairs, youth, and sports. And why I want to focus on sports is because as the panel has said before, we need to think about diversifying this economy. We can see clearly just after COVID, we are now standing on one pillar, which is the financial services. So by focusing on sports, I can then try to actually diversify the economy by having sports tourism um, into the islands. And that's why I think I'm, I'm most interested. I think my degree would lend a lot of skill set to that area. So definitely if I had to choose, it would be community service, um, sports and youth, for sure. Thank you. For the next question, uh, I will address this first to Mr. Webster. And it's already been touched on by a number of you during previous answers, the subject of affordable housing. Cayman Islands has one of the world's highest GDPs per capita, but the Caymanian dream of purchasing or building a home seems to be slipping away. What strategies would you support or propose to ensure that there is affordable housing for residents in Georgetown West? Thank you for the question. The affordable homes are very challenging for most people now, and that's a concern. Many years ago, when I was growing up as a kid, it was always the Cayman dream to hear your uncle or you hear your aunt or siblings saying that I would like a house. That Cayman dream has now become an illusion. How we can fix that problem is that we first need to have a law put in place where persons cannot just buy raw land if they're not Caymanians. What is happening is that persons are banking the raw land, making it very expensive in the real estate market, pushing the, the real estate costs up. So developers cannot have access to that land. Government cannot have access to big, large parcels of land. And that is what is driving up the cost. So until we can get that done, we're always going to have a situation where the price of affordable homes are not affordable. They're going to only be affordable for those that have and not the have-nots. So we need to change that gear. People can sit um, in their office in you know, Brussels, wherever, and they can just you know, wire the money and have, you know, um, hundreds of acres of land being purchased and you just keep it there, sit and not develop for many, many years. And that is a major concern when it comes to affordable homes. So I would like to see that change to give our people the opportunity of bringing the affordable homes to a much lower cost. Thank you. 
Ms. McGoole Lumsden. Well, let's start with the background, how we got here. We literally got here because, like Kendrick actually said, there are investors in various different geographical locations throughout the world that literally can pick up the phone and acquire a piece of property in the Cayman Islands. And so when you're talking about millionaires and billionaires who are investing here, they, of course, can pay whatever amount the de developers are asking for. And so that's driving up the cost for young Caymanians and Caymanians themselves. So what I do propose is, one, government needs to be very vigilant and very aggressive when it comes to acquiring crown land within the Cayman Islands to try to build as much affordable homes for young Caymanians and Caymanians themselves. And in, in addition to that, we need to lend resources into the National Housing Development Trust um, so that they can obviously build more affordable homes within the Cayman Islands. But I alluded to this earlier. Dialogue must now be entertained between the private developers and government themselves. And what that's going to do is government saying to them, OK, I'm going to give you various concessions or a certain amount with regards to concession. That concession can then obviously decrease the amount of a purchasing um, price for a young Caymanian or a first time owner. We have to think about lending concessions that's beneficial to our community and continue to put the people, or they haven't in this instance, put the people first when it comes to individuals, the voters, and the people of the Cayman Islands. That's what we need to do. In addition, we need to think about increasing the stamp duty for foreign investors. I wouldn't say ban them altogether. That's not something I'm going to agree to. But I think you would be surprised the number of foreign investors that come to this island are on the phone and there's no stamp duty that's related to housing. We need to think about increasing that number significantly and so that that stamp duty can be lent to other resources such as education. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I, I recognize years ago that we have a challenge despite the fact that we have a high GDP as the question suggests that there were problems for Caymanians to be able to save a certain amount of money to be able to even get the deposit uh, necessary to get that loan or mortgage from the bank, which is where the majority of Caymanians will fall, in the ability to get a mortgage but difficulty getting it, which is why I introduced the pension amendment, allowing person to be able to draw up to 35000 and it has worked. And let me just say, I think that the contractors out there is only reasonable that they're going to try to market themselves in terms of their construction to persons who can afford it. And if they can sell this for hundred thousand dollar homes, that's what they're going to do. But it also means that government has a responsibility while they capture that part of the market to deal with the section of the market that cannot afford a three hundred thousand dollar house. And this is one of the things, as I mentioned before, that I did while in office. We had a consortium of, con of contractors that were able to build affordable homes. So it's proven that you can build two bedroom homes, really nice, beautiful homes, uh, for 75,000 for two beds and 90,000 for three beds. And I definitely think what we need is we need to perhaps reduce some of the sizes of the lots, but I think those homes are actually viable and they're doable. I mean, if you even go to Georgetown West and Smith Road Villas, there's not a lot of land there, but the houses are really nice that was built by Mr. Frank Hall. And at the same time, the lots of land are small. So those sort of environments I think we can actually construct today and allow Caymanians to transition into those homes at very affordable prices. I want to say that while I was in office as well, one of the things I did was actually pass them um, when we were increasing stamp duties within the zone A. Mm -hmm. I actually passed a piece of legislation that was going to allow a lot of those monies to be able to go to the National Housing Development Trust to be able to be used specifically for housing. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened. But if I do get a chance to serve again in office, I'm going to make sure that it does. But either way, in short, I definitely think that everything is there to actually facilitate us being able to build these affordable homes. We simply need the people that has the know-how, the tenacity, and the will to make it happen. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is going to be the last question before we go to another break. Um, it's going to be on beach access. Um, Ms. McGaugh Lumsden, we're going to start with you. Under the Prescription Act, access to the beaches is to be unencumbered for all. If elected, would you support the protection of the prescription rights to, to, prov uh, to provide developers, to prevent p developers from blocking access to the beaches? Absolutely. <laughs> Most of my <laughs> memories have to do with the beach. It is incomprehensible 
that we are allowing these things to happen in our society that belongs to us. And it really is that simple. Do I support it? Of course. Because at the end of the day, when it, it is actually in the law, but in addition to that, these amendments was brought on the floor, I think it was the end of 2020. But because of political pressure, they abandoned those amendments. Why is it that one can think that you can come into this country and not expect that indigenous Caymanians and Caymanians and residents must not has, have access to the beach? So of course, if elected, I'm going to go by all means to protect when it comes to the prescription rights to prevent developers from blocking any access whatsoever. Because as Caymanians, as citizens, we have a right to be here and we have a right to have access to those beaches. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. Well, I can probably try to make this one a short one. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just tell you, first of all, everyone in this country, every single person living in the Cayman Islands deserves to have access to the beach, especially the Caymanians. I am tired. This has been an issue that's been going on for long, and it's just one of those perfectly simple examples of how government after government just has not made it a priority because their people are simply not a priority. I actually... 100% subscribe to the fact that we need to make it a prescriptive right. And these individuals, and there's very few, I don't think it's everyone, but anyone blocking these ways, you know, with trunks and chairs and everything that's encumbering persons getting access to the beach, they need to be levied with some seriously high fines. And honestly, I mean really heavy fines. I, my mind starts at 100,000. I want to see serious action taking of persons who are blocking the beach. It is a complete contempt for the people living in these islands, and especially Caymanians, blocking access to the beach. Now, that said, I want to make sure that I stress on the side that Caymanians or anyone visiting the beach, let's be respectful to other persons as well, make sure there's no trash being thrown around, but at the same time, don't block access to the beach for my people. I'm not going to tolerate that. Well, thank you. Mr. Webster, same question, please. <laughs> Make your uh, definitely. Um, the beach um, is something, the beach access is something that has been fought with um, between developers and the residents, and this has been going on for too long. We need to stop that. We need to ensure that before developers can develop the, their property, that there's a prescribed, in law, there's a prescribed access by with dimensions and it must be fenced off and pretty much paved partially down the um, down the beach access so and even if you have to go to a point where government registered that with a block and parcel number to ensure that there's no ambiguity right that has to be done because we have been going through this and it's been causing a lot of problems but not only beach access I want to think about coastal access what happens when we have a lot of the iron shore throughout the different parts of the island, when you want to fish from the coastal area that are not marine parks, we need to have a plan that we can have access. These need to be identified early before persons develop in those vicinities so that we can give our people access to the iron shore so that if they want to fish, so it's just not beach, it would be coastal access. We also need to look at the easement we have a lot of easement that has been within the Georgetown vicinity. For example, one that comes to mind quite clearly is the one by Elizabethan Square. That easement should be labeled, it should be marked, because if we don't, at some other point in time, persons can go ahead and just close in on that easement. We need to look at easements and make sure that they are clearly marked and identified so that persons will know exactly that that is an easement area that they can have access to. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the second round of questions. So when we return, we'll begin the third round. Please stay with us. March in Cayman is hot, but at Foster's, it's frozen. Frozen Food Month is back, and we're giving away four $250 Foster's cards. To win or just purchase any three products from the Frozen Department from now until March 27th. It's that easy. You could grab a frozen pizza for dinner, frozen berries for a morning smoothie, and frozen plant-based sausages for something different. Exactly. Just don't forget to enter online at fosters.ky slash frozen food month. Foster's, better because we care.
In the last episode, we learned about the important role of companies here in Cayman that do business with overseas customers and generate new wealth for the Cayman Islands economy. But what about all the other companies in the Cayman Islands? How do they fit into our prosperity engine? Every business in the Cayman Islands falls into one of three groups, or tiers. Each tier plays a critical role in our economy. The first tier is made up of all the companies that do business with overseas customers and bring money into our economy. Companies in this tier are like the gas tank of our economic prosperity engine. The more we have in the tank, the farther we can go. Although most well-known companies in this tier are in financial services like Butterfield Bank or tourism like the Ritz-Carlton, there are many other well-known tier one companies doing business with overseas customers like Unit Registry, Health City, and all of the companies in Cayman Enterprise City. The second tier of the economy is all the companies that do business with other local companies, like IT and marketing consultants, or companies that sell supplies to bars and restaurants. These companies are also very important because without them, the companies they supply would need to buy their goods and services from overseas. So while companies in Tier 1 bring money into our economy, companies in Tier 2 help keep it here. The third tier is made up of all the companies that provide services to people that live and work in the Cayman Islands. Companies in this tier include supermarkets, dry cleaners, mechanics, gyms, doctors, dentists, architects, house builders, florists, and gardeners. These companies are important sources of employment and business opportunities for our people. And they play a really important role because without them, Cayman wouldn't be a very nice place to live. So to recap, Tier 1 companies do business with customers overseas. Tier 2 companies do business with other companies in Cayman. And Tier 3 companies do business with those who live here. Every company and self-employed contractor in the Cayman Islands falls into one of these three tiers. And they all play an important role in making our nation prosperous, helping bring money into our country, improve our economy, and creating jobs. And without them, the Cayman Islands wouldn't be the great country that it is. Thanks for watching. And remember to share this on social media so we can all help fuel the economic prosperity engine. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown West. We've gone through two rounds of questions. We now go into the third round, and we'll begin with uh, the first round of questions with President Mike Gibbs. Thank you, Will. This question will address to Mr. Solomon first. It focuses on minimum wage. What are your views on the current minimum wage of $6 per hour and the knock-on effect to the cost of living of any future increase? Yeah. Well, thank you, Gibbs, for the question. I mean, you know, first of all, I, I do my best to try to make sure that a free market can have a chance to operate. I, I don't like a lot of artificial behavior. Uh, that said, we do have a minimum wage. That's water under the bridge. When I was in government, one of the things I did was the cleanup program. Because, again, I don't believe in necessarily just handing out checks, despite the fact that I've been accused of doing that. But I was handing out shovels and rakes and giving people an opportunity to clean up their country, take pride in it, and they actually got a salary for it. At the time, and I mentioned this because I did hear someone mention it at a meeting, but at the time I paid them $10 an hour, and I paid them $10 an hour, particularly because I believe it was a short period of time that they had to work and needed sufficient enough money to make sure they could buy something for Christmas or for New Year's. But that said, in terms of any adjustments to the minimum wage, we have to be careful when we give politicians power over certain things. It just becomes a big campaign effort. I mean, we're seeing it right now, you know, promises of $2,000 if we get back in, you know, but yet at the same time, you don't hear any promise on that 2000 being used to help upskill or reskill people. I would think it would be very good to take that $2,000 and say, hey, let me get you some training in tiling or plumbing, electrical, rather than just giving away the hard earned money of taxpayers of this country completely ridiculous. So before there'd be any adjustments in minimum wage, as far as I'm concerned, we need to have the proper studies done. We have a board under the legislation that accommodates that. And if they come back and say there should be an adjustment, negative or positive, then I think we can make a move on it. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question, please. Well, the minimum wage um, has been up for review for quite some time now. 
I feel if we're going to do a minimum wage increase, it should be done by industry. So, for example, the, you have the financial industry already that supersedes the $6. We have in the construction industry, they have an understanding for carpenters and masons that they're a, a increased rate more than $6. So I think if we start looking and doing it by industries, then we will be able to um, change the gear with persons. Persons would probably be interested um, in going into a particular field because of the remunerations, and it would incentivize them, and we could have the necessary training to put them in that category, especially on areas where there's we are going to focus on TVET programs. So I think it's important that if we do a minimum wage, we don't just do it across the board, because if we do it across the board, I'm telling you that what's going to happen, if you think that we have problems now with business closing, it's going to be a lot more. The NAU lines will be up to prospect because businesses will be closed. So I would suggest that if we're going to do on the review a minimum wage increase, we do it by by industries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGill Lumsden. Let me unequivocally say that I do not agree with regards to the six dollars minimum wage. I think it's something that needs to be reviewed. I think with the six dollar minimum wage, what we did was created a number of persons, including the person in Georgetown West, below the poverty line. And it, people that are making $6 an hour just simply cannot live a good quality standard of life. It's really that simple. So does it have to be rev reviewed? Absolutely. To what amount? I don't have any idea what that could be. But I want to say that should there's a flip side to that. Should we increase the minimum wage to $758? Will that be passed on to you and I as consumers when we go to Burger Shack or other small companies? Companies already are screaming that the cost of living and to facilitate an employee in this country is significant. And so I would have to first and foremost see um, critical data that will tell me what that minimum wage should be increased to because I think it has enormous impacts in, within our society. And, yeah, so I don't agree with the $6 minimum wage. Thank you. All right, Mr. Webster, um, we're going to start back with you. Um, something that you're probably familiar with, uh, it's the cruise industry. What are your views on the future of the cruise industry of the Cayman Islands? Thank you for the question. Um, the future for the cruise industry, I think it's going to be a while before we see crews come back to these shores. But what I would like to see a responsible action done in respect to the uh, cruise industry. For many years, we have been putting too many people on our shores, 1.9 million um, passengers per year. Our infrastructure cannot sustain that amount of passengers. I think we need to look at quality instead of quantity. Uh, when it comes to the cruise industry. There's many, many high-end cruise ships that we can attract here to make it much more financial viable for persons who are working in the industry. One of the things that I suggested many years ago when I was on the Public Transportation Board was setting up an authority that would regulate the rates so that cruise lines would not be able to bargain with the operators and drive down the cost of the, of the product that we offer here. For example, Stingray City. I was a consultee back in 2008, on a vision 2008, um, with Mr. Chris. The operators who were into that room doing Stingray City at the time was making $25 um, per person per, on each trip. And 10 years later, they were making $10 a head. Right? Because the cruise industry came in and, and they used a formula to entice them to drive the price down. But if you set up an authority, this authority would be able to regulate the, the rates um, depending on the category. For example, if you have horseback riding, everyone who's going to offer horseback riding come around the table. They come up with a, a minimum rate, and that rate would be what would be used. 
the cruise lines would not be able to use any operator that is not approved by that authority. So they cannot go to the, to the port to pick up passengers. So this would be a way for us to make sure that we're getting top value and our people are treated right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. McGar Lumsden? Cruise industry. I think it'll be a while before that is obviously open. But what I think we need to do, are we getting value with regards to the cruise industry? And is it trickle down to Caymanians? That's our main concern, because at all times, again, we have to put the, peoples, the people first. But on the flip side of that, if we're not getting value or very little value, do we then think about increasing a significant or having a significant number of stay over visitors? That's where we actually are generating revenue within our country. And so although I think it's going to be a while before the cruise industry does open, in addition, to, in addition to that, I think when it comes to the cruise industry, we have to think about the environmental, environmental impacts that it's having on our country, whether it's in marine parks or whether it's actually on pollution. It is having significant damage to, to our environment. And that is, in this day and age, we have to think environment, environment, environment. Um, but I think more focus needs to be on stay over visitors rather than that of the cruise ship industry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. I think I can say that uh, cruise tourism is very, very important to Cayman Islands, but it has been managed properly. The, the reports will show that cruise tourists that come here, you get a 2% transition rate from cruise tourists that become stay over. So if you even wanted to throw out the number that was previously mentioned of 1.9 million, it means at least four to 7,000 people will come back as a stay over. So it is one way of increasing stay overs. But that said, if we do a good job and give those persons who come here, regardless of what the number is, because I'm not saying that 1.9 million or 1.2 million as what is guaranteed by FCCA is the right number, but it gives us an opportunity for great advertisement as well. If the proper environment is, is if that first impression is great, but having them lined up on the south or north terminal like cattle in the sun is not making a good impression. And we're actually ruining our business. We need to give a proper customer experience. So we need to protect our environment. So again, I, I definitely want to take side in terms of those persons who are concerned about peers and the construction of that to make sure that our environment is not damaged. But let's make sure that we know what the numbers are that we want and that it's reasonable and that our infrastructure can support it. Like, you know, where are the public facilities? Am I having to go into private business to have a, to use the loop? Or do we actually have some proper facilities? There's a myriad of infrastructure things that needs to be done. The government, for example, promised, this government that's been in there for two terms, promised from 2013 that they were going to revitalize Georgetown. Not a single thing has been done, except for lately they've sent an RFP. That, that sort of thing is unacceptable. But let's make sure we protect our environment. Let's find out what the numbers are. And let's make that first impression a really good one. But is cruise tourism good for the country? If managed properly, it is. It translates to 2% of the persons who come here, stay for a week, and for longer periods of time and spend real money into the economy. Thank you. For the next question, uh, I'll be addressing this first to Ms. McGore Lumsden. It focuses on health insurance. And health insurance premiums continue to increase annually for many businesses and especially for persons who reach retirement age. <clears throat> what improvements, if any, would you propose to make health insurance more affordable for businesses and especially retirees? Well, as previously mentioned, and I'll focus more on the elderly, in canvassing Georgetown West, it is incredibly dis dis depressing to see what has happened to our elderly. And so we need to establish a better way to facilitate the bureaucracy that exists between the elderly, the elderly that in Georgetown West and, and, World, and, and Cayman with regards to NAU, because a significant amount of them depend on NAU for their insurance. And every six months, they actually have to revisit and be evaluated and then determine if they're actually qualified for that health insurance. What we're doing is marginalizing, ostracizing, and not allowing the elderly to have access to good medical uh, facilities to good med Medicare, Medicare. And I think it's important that we somehow, whether it's concierge services or whether it's the MP or set up a district council to facilitate 
what is happening with NAU. And I think once we do that, we can then obviously improve the quality of lives when it comes to our elderly, because we're at a stage where you're visiting these elderly, and believe it or not, they're choosing between groceries or going to the doctor. And so some of them are actually staying at home and slowly dying because they do not have the access when it comes to health care. Thank you. Mr. Solomon, same question. Yeah, well, definitely health, health insurance is, is a major issue. When we can talk about a, a SHIC program that's costing people somewhere around $190, it is a, a serious cost for the individual, and it's a serious cost for businesses, and something has to be done about it. I remember running the calculations actually in 2017 with Mr. Connolly, and when you look at what was actually being spent in relation to um, indigents at Cineco, as well as what was being done in the private sector, I can assure you that what can be done, and I, I try to make sure that whatever ideas I have is not just all government driven, but in, includes the private sector. I think that you have a lot of insurance companies, and some would even argue maybe too many insurance companies. So what's happening is the pie is being spliced up so much that rather than having that voluminous a fund that would actually be able to accrue the proper interest to be able to translate into real savings for the customer, it is split so much up between insurance companies that it doesn't actually um, get realized. So I think you need to be able to create somewhat of a national fund that those same players can play in, but everybody's contributing to the one fund. And if we can do that and manage it properly, I believe, with the proper processes and procedures in place, that we will be able to realize better better rates and pass those on to the consumers. And I believe we can definitely even half what we're seeing now on things like the standard SHIC program. Thank you. Mr. Webster. With health insurance, um, that has been a major concern. Visiting some of the people, um, not only in Georgetown West, but throughout the island over the years, because I've been involved with so much community projects, I've seen where persons are having serious, serious problems of just getting health insurance. And that is concerning to me. It's concerning because some of them have some dire health challenges, such as cancer, diabetes, and they go to um, sleep at night just thinking about whether or not they can afford medication, um, whether or not they can afford um, to have you know, something to eat. So I think it's very important that we look on this health care um, plan. I would propose that we do a national health insurance plan. We have six to, about 65,000 people. And if we go to our reinsurers on the basis of 65,000 people, what will happen is that we will get a better rate overall. That would then allow us to have lower premiums um, for each person. And it would also be an inclusive program, um, healthcare program. Why it would be inclusive? Because currently, when you look at the civil service, the civil servants are pretty much um, a big, big um, provider of employment. And most of them are on uh, cynical. So if you take that amount of loan and you um, put that along with the private sector and develop a good healthcare plan, um, you would be able to bring down the rates. But with the health, national health care plan, if you want to go to a public or private, um, currently the civil servants can go to um, public, uh, so to private. But if they, in this case, they would be able to, but however, they would have to do a co-pay, right? This would also eliminate the fact that persons who have pre-existing conditions, they would be able to uh, be covered under the um, health insurance, national health insurance plan. So this would be a comprehensive plan that would allow each person, those persons that are having mental health issues, physically challenged, they will also be covered under this, under this plan. And we need to make sure that when we have a plan, it covers each and every one. The actual cost is about $1,500 for a family of um, you know, four to get health care coverage. That is very expensive, and that would also give our families much more disposable income. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Solomon? This is going to be the next questions for you, and it's regarding the future of financial services. Mm -hmm. Given that financial services is critical to the island's economy, how do you think the country should respond to the FATF gray list and the European Union's intention to blacklist us, even though we have met most of their requirements? Yeah. 
I mean, we, we continue to be under attack in terms of the financial services. And I, I want to say that I think what the Cayman Islands has to offer is greater than simply the financial services. I think what is really, what we're really offering is a wonderful economic model called the Cayman Islands. When you actually look at Cayman Islands, I've, chat, I've chatted with Americans, for example, and said, you, you do appreciate that you don't own that property. When you're paying income tax, you're renting the property, you don't own it. When you talk about here in Cayman Islands, you're talking about ownership. So we have an economic model that we need to take to the world. And I hear I'm talking about getting someone to lobby for us in EU or getting someone in Washington to lobby. The politicians aren't going to help us. It's in their interest to keep Cayman Islands uh, the way it is and to use us as some sort of a scapegoat for any problems that happens in their jurisdiction with the greatest of respect. I think we need a marketing campaign, but it has to be a grassroots campaign. And in fact, I think this is places where a Chamber of Commerce, for example, working with other chambers can get us into access to the grassroots. When we can actually sit and explain the model of the Cayman Islands economy to the average person in the United States or in Europe, they're going to understand it. And they're not going to be able to be as easily bamboozled and fooled by their politicians anymore. Because if you can mention to a good red-blooded American, as we would say, that, listen, here in the Cayman Islands, you actually own property. You're not renting it. And we don't take money or, you know, we're not taking your money and putting it in an envelope and sending it on to the government. They'll perfectly understand it. And the politicians won't be able to fool them anymore. So we need to market, but we need to market to the right persons. And that's it. I do want to say that there's other things that we can do personally to improve financial services, but hopefully I can address that in another question. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question. The goalposts with the um, EU has been changed almost every year. We have brought up the standards to try to meet the requirements by the EU over the years to remove us from the blacklist, remove us from the gray list. Um, we have done an extraordinary job trying to do that, but they continue each year to shift the goalposts on us. Their ultimate goal is to ensure that they can try to tax us. That's the ultimate goal. Um, 92 different countries outside of the European Union that are faced with the EU saying that these countries are either abusing the tax regime. We're not abusing it, we're just being compliant. We, look to, we have to look at our market share. Who is actually using most of our financial services? Where they're coming from? It's not from the EU. So I think we need to have a team that will sit down with them and say, listen, we have met all of your requirements. We've had in almost every department now, you have to have a compliance officer, right? Even if you're going to start pumping gas, you're going to have to have a compliance officer for that. So I think it's about time that we go and negotiate, renegotiate and say, listen, uh, we have been trying to be compliant. So guess what? I want to ensure that if this is not done, we're going to focus more primarily on our customers because if we have to keep on putting more um, pressure on our clients, we're going to lose those clients. So we have to negotiate this right and let them know that we're not playing around anymore. So I think it's important that we um, focus on better negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Uh, Ms. Magar Lumsden. I think of the various criteria that were set out, I think we didn't meet two or three criteria, which is completely unacceptable to put us on the gray list with the intentions of putting us on, going to put us on the blacklist. Having said that, I just think it's a political football field, and it really is that simple for me. We're always going to be under attack because the Cayman Islands is not supposed to be exactly in the position that they're supposed to be in. And it's as simple as that. We have to continue to do what is necessary from a compliance standpoint. Yes, absolutely. Are we trying to avoid uh, certain money laundering? Absolutely, we're trying to do that. We are endeavoring, we're endeavoring to do the best that we possibly can. And I don't think that we could do anything more. It literally boils down to the fact we're not supposed to be where exactly we are when it comes to the financial services that Kim and Outlands provide. And it's as simple as that. Thank you. Mr. Webster, for the last question in the third round, I'll start with you, and it focuses on employment and the Department of Work. 
So with regards to the new Department of Work system that has been implemented in recent years, do you consider the system a success? If not, what improvements would you recommend? The current system at the Department of Work, WRC, is not WRKING for all of us. The system was implemented. It was not tested properly. I think they should have had a proper testing of the system with businesses and individuals um, to do a survey to make sure that it, before they launched the system that it was tested properly. I would like to ensure that I work closely with the um, Department of Work um, by making sure that the system is set up where that they can assess the individuals um, that are unemployed so that they would be fit in the right category. So when they are placed for a job, that they would be able to be um, fit for purpose for that particular job. The system right now, when you try to log in into the system, you have to create a password. You should be able to view the applications that are available to you. And if you decide to, then you should be able to then create a password, go in and log in into the system. So that is a failure. When you have a failure in a system like that, it's putting our people behind because we have more people then depending on NAU and people that are unemployed. So it becomes another social issue that we're having. So I would like to make sure that that system is rectified to get our people up and ready for the workforce and work employment in this country. Thank you. Ms. McGill Lamston. I have to be very careful with this because I deal with immigration on a daily basis. <laughs> so I'll be very careful with this. I think it's, uh, there have been various complaints when it comes to work itself, and they're trying their very best. They have made several changes because of the number of complaints that they have received. Having said that, I don't think it's the system per se, it was the timing. They literally launched it and transitioned this, I think it was sometime in October. So it was immediately after COVID. And so what, has ha what had happened is that in the middle of a pandemic, people are just going to want to do things the way that they usually do things. And so the necessary resources was not lended to business. The necessary resources was not lended to business from a training standpoint to understand the system. So there wasn't a proper rollout when it comes to work itself. So are there improvements to be made? Absolutely. With every single system there is in Cayman Islands, there are improvements to be made. Do they continue to make improvements? Are they taking heed to the improvements and the suggestions when it comes to investors like myself, who is an immigration specialist? I think that they are. Thank you, Mr. Salmon. Having had the opportunity to chat with persons who are intimately, very intimately involved with WRC, the, the fact of the matter is, is that despite what the government may have put on the surface, a lot of the same rules and lack of clarity, opaqueness was occurring behind the scenes. And therefore, you have not seen a lot of changes. And with the greatest respect, I want the Cayman Islands public, the Caymanians, to realize that the government has been playing this game for a very, very long time. And let me give two things. First of all, I brought the amendment for Jobs for Caymanians only. It was passed in 2013. And let me just stress for all those persons who are even status holders, you're a Caymanian also. And for those who are striving to become a Caymanian, you should also embrace the piece of legislation for jobs for Caymanians only. But you have had a government that despite the fact that they played a role in passing that legislation for the last eight years, have not sought fit to put one single job on a schedule that they felt were good enough to be for Caymanians only. We did it. We did it for notaries. So what? Garbage persons? Receptionist, there is no job that should be for Caymanians only, but it's fine for the financial services industry to ship off jobs to India or wherever it is in, in the world to do answering phones to manage Cayman Islands funds, but we can't find our elderly, we can't find Caymanians to manage a fund and answer a phone? No, of course we can. You don't need WRC for that. We have Section 80 of the labor law, and it's very, very simple. You have labor officers right now. There's Caymanians who are in the workplace, and they've been put down for a key position. They're down for manager. They have no idea they're down there. And then you have employers who are constructively dismissing them. Here's how you solve the problem. You've got labor officers. They go in, and they check and say, why is this Caymanian getting 50000 for the same job that this guy was getting 110? And you fine them. After you get a hundred or $20,000 fine, stuff like that starts, starts to stop really, really quick. 
So the teeth is there, the resources are there, but what's lacking is the will of any government to really do something about protecting Caymanians and getting Caymanian jobs. And I want to stress to persons, I know it, I know it myself firsthand. I was there in the government, managed 27 persons, did a wonderful job, and I remember going to one bank and trying to get a very simple job, and they said, sorry, you don't qualify, but you know what the situation was? The person who was telling me I didn't qualify was also sitting on the immigration board to help to determine that the permit for that bank would be approved. It needs to stop. Thank you. Three rounds of questions completed. One more round left, so please stay tuned. Right, we'll be back right after this short break. At Bay Market Cafe, we know life can get in the way of good food, so we're here to offer a hand. Online ordering is back, and this time, it's better than ever. If you overslept and are running out of time, order online and pick it up. Raining? Get it delivered. On your way to go there or do that, order and pick it up. Sun scorching? Meeting? Get it delivered. That way, you can spend more time doing this or that with him, her, they, and them. So whether you need your morning coffee, you're craving a red velvet donut, ramen, a lamb burger, or a falafel pita, order the food you love and skip the line. Pick it up or have it delivered. That's Bay Market Online. When companies do well, everyone does well. Not just the business owners, but the employees, other businesses, the government, and even the customers. Seriously. To learn how, let's look at how money flows through a company. When a company sells its goods and services, they receive money, which is called revenue. That money is then split up and used in a number of different ways. Some of the money goes to employees. To keep it simple, we'll call this salaries. Some of the money goes to pay for products and services the company needs to keep running. Those expenses are called overheads. Some of the revenue goes to the government in duties and fees. And finally, any money left over goes to the owners of the business as profit. So no matter what products or services a company provides, it's like a machine that takes in money as revenue and spits money out as salaries, overheads, government fees, and profits. It's really that simple. Every dollar that a company takes in gets turned into one of those four things. Okay, so how does it benefit everyone when companies do well? Let's take a closer look. First, with salaries, salaries are important for the economy because most people get most of their income from their employment. Next, government fees. In the Cayman Islands, the vast majority of the government's revenue comes from duties and fees paid by businesses. That money goes to pay for important government services like education, emergency services, health care, and infrastructure. Then we have overheads. Quite simply, one company's overhead is just another company's revenue. When a hotel needs supplies, they buy them from local suppliers. Those suppliers turn that revenue into salaries, overheads, duties and fees, and if they're lucky, profit. Some people think that business owners make too much money, but the truth is, the average company only makes seven and a half cents in profit for every dollar in sales. And that's assuming they make a profit at all. The other 92 and a half cents goes to pay for salaries for staff, overheads that become revenue of other companies, and duties and fees that pay for the government services we need. In order to become successful, most business owners have to work extremely hard and take a lot of risks. If it wasn't for the ability to make a profit, the owner wouldn't have started the business in the first place. And if nobody started any businesses, there would be no jobs for employees, which means no salaries, no overheads to support other businesses, and no money from government fees to pay for our government services. So yeah, when companies do well, everyone does well. In the next video, we'll take a closer look at why countries need economic growth. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown West. We reached a stage with the final round of questions, and I'm going to turn this one over to President, um, actually Vice President mm -hmm. Dilbert. Thank you, Will. Um, we're going to start off the questions with Ms. Uh, McGaw-Lemston. Uh, it's going to be on cost of living. 
The cost of living ranked as the top issue for respondents in the most recent Chamber public survey. What additional strategies would you propose to address this issue beyond the ones you've already touched on? Yes, I would have to say in Georgetown, where I send the wild Cayman Islands, cost of living is on everyone's mind and it's something that needs to be addressed. I think honestly, Nelson, how we can alleviate the cost of living or help with the cost of living in the Cayman Islands. And let me please be specific with certain things. We have around 14,000 individuals in the Cayman Islands that earns less than $2,400 a month. So when you have to factor in rent, a gallon of milk, of course, in the Cayman Islands is $7 alone. So how are these people supposed to maintain a decent standard of living? We're in a crisis when it comes to the cost of living. But what I think that needs to be implemented is a consumer protection law, first and foremost. I think what that's going to help to do is, um, is, is to govern unfair practices within the industry. That is the first thing that we need to do. In addition to that, what I think is required is that we waive stamp duty on basic family necessities. It's as simple as that, and so that it can actually be passed on to us as consumers. And what is a good thing for us to start dialogue and start investing in is upskilling our Caymanians. And by upskilling Caymanians, that in turn means that you're actually going to demand so much more when it comes from our pay standpoint. And so if we upskill them, empower them, uptrain them, whatever is required in order for them to actually be better employees, that is what is needed at this time. And so that they actually can help, you know, have more income into their pockets and they wouldn't have to be at that level where they're earning $6 per hour, they can actually put themselves in so much better positions for their, for themselves and their families. Thank you. Mr. Solomon? Again, I am, I'm compelled to, to, to cover some ground, but if you look at the compendium of statistics from the ESO, they will show you that the top three things in terms of the cost of living is number one, housing and utilities, and the second one is going to be transportation, and the other one is food. Address those three issues according <clears throat> to the Economic and Statistics Office, and we've covered the ground. And all of the answers are already there. This government has sat there for eight years and have mm -hmm. failed, for example, in terms of the national energy policy to just simply go out and make sure that a, that a, a 12 megabit battery is actually put in CUC so that people can actually get solar panels in their homes. So right now, they'll have to wait until 2022. So if you want to go out right now and buy panels and put $18,000 worth of panel in your house to reduce your electricity to 50, you can't do it until 2022. Complete negligence. I think we need to fix that problem. I talked about the issue about food. I think that we can engage in agriculture. We can free up the lock land in East End. <coughs> but in addition to that, we can look at getting farms and purchasing them turnkey operations and whether it be Honduras, Jamaica or even parts of the United States. And we make it that the products that are already there, because many of them are already being exported to the United States, that becomes an export product for the Cayman Islands. Not for that country, but for us. In addition to that, all the, the products being imported here can either be at very reduced rates or completely free and lower the cost on food as well. I think we can lower food and I think on the issue about transportation, we need to look at something different. Buses are fine, but buses sitting in traffic is still buses sitting in traffic. And it might sound a little bit outlandish, but I believe it's absolutely viable that the Cayman Islands can implement a monorail system. And I'll tell you why I think a monorail system is very good. Amongst other things, if we do it properly, a lot of it can be off of the, the, the main area, covering some of the mangrove footprints and make wonderful tours for whether it be locals or foreigners who are actually visiting. In addition to that, if done properly, it can actually house our utilities in it, the electricity. The water can actually go in there and remove a lot of the light poles and other things that exist. And I think when we can implement that transportation and lower that cost, because I would definitely like to reduce it, lower the transportation, lower the cost of housing is the other one. I mentioned that um, numerous times and I'll mention it again. It is absolutely possible to build a three bedroom house for that 90,000 and allow our Caymans to transition. Do those three things and we lower the cost of living. Thank you. Mr. Webster. Thank you. Um, earlier, I mentioned um, one of the components that is important to bring down the cost of living, and that is the health insurance. I think it's important that we look on all of the facets, all of the areas that um, earmarks what causes the height of cost of living. And 
one that comes directly to my mind is the health insurance. So by reducing that, that's going to help. But we also have to look beyond that. Um, education is and training is important to upskill our people, to put them in the right categories. And that would tie back with what I mentioned about um, given the minimum wage being done in different um, sectors, right? Um, that would allow persons to be trained and receive much more disposable income. We also have to look on um, domestic inflation. Uh, domestic inflation, you're talking about um, having products and services that you're using domestically. For example, farming. We've been challenged with COVID-19. It was a panic during COVID-19 about the supply of food. But we can produce food here um, that we could have a substantial amount of food for local consumption. With my, with being a backyard farmer, I understand why the farmer's price are the way it is today, because they have to depend heavily on supply of water. The water, we can, get, uh, we can give um, concessions on water for those farmers, and I think that would also bring down the cost of these products that we have domestically. Then we also have to think about um, imported inflation. Imported inflation is the aspect of where, where um, the markets are where we're bringing in things. We have to look beyond the U.S. We have to look on different markets, tap into different markets, um, whether or not it's South America, to be able to bring down the cost of the products. The banks plays an integral role in this whole thing with cost of living. We have to go back to the banks, try to negotiate um, not only um, um, the period of time that we have for those um, persons, especially in the commercial um, business, you have like um, a very short time. We need to get that exp uh, extended for at least for another 10 years so that the merchants can get a better price and the uh, on retail rental and the consumers will then benefit from that. So holistically, that would bring down the cost of living. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Solomon, we will look to you for this next question, which actually will be the last question of the evening to allow every, you uh, candidates to give your closing uh, statements, and we will finish on schedule. This last question focuses on our youth, uh, and the question is, what do you regard as the top two issues facing our youth of today, and how do you intend to address those concerns if elected? Yeah. Again, I, I think that when it comes to our youth, I definitely see, particularly speaking in Georgetown West, there is an issue about jobs, and I believe it transcends across that other constituencies as well. But jobs is a, is a fundamental thing. We have to be able to provide jobs, and I think that there are real opportunities. I mentioned earlier on that I'm fully aware that even in the financial services industry, to pick on them, a lot of jobs are outsourced. Understand that right now in the Cayman Islands, we're, we're number one in the world for funds. And our funds are being managed by persons, whether in India, China, all around the world. And no one can tell me that a lot of our elderly people, but again, to stick on our youth, cannot be properly trained to manage those funds. No one can tell me that our youth can't come in and answer a phone, but we have to have a call center in Asia. There's a lot of opportunities right now, and they need to actually be exploited because a fundamental thing is about getting them into jobs. I heard him talking the other day about the fact that many of our young persons are actually suffering from depression. Depression, yeah, because depression, you can't find a job. The other one is the whole issue about drugs. And again, I think we need to look at that comprehensively, holistically, because again, that is in large part because of all the other issues that those individuals are having to deal with in their homes. As I mentioned earlier on, financial problems is a fundamental reason for divorce, and it's also a major reason why a lot of our young persons and older persons as well are turning to alcohol and to illicit drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Webster, same question. Thank you. It goes back to, uh, our youth goes back to education again. And I, I keep on saying education because we find that education is important for the development of our youth. I also find that the youth programs that are available um, for some of our youth is not working. And one of the disconnects that we have when it comes to programs are for 
youth that are between 16 and 18 years of age. Normally you find like soccer or basketball under 16 or under 15, but that is a period where we are lacking certain programs. We need to make sure that we have programs that can be effective for them. But going back to education, the career guidance is lacking within the school. So even though they are getting an education, those uh, students um, or the youth are not guided. We have a careers day, but we do not have career guidance to channel them in the right direction. What are the choices? And we have a stigma within our community where uh, uh, youths um, in the country are under a lot of pressure from peers um, and family members just by telling them what type of job that they should select. And I think that is unfair. Once they are making an honest dollar, then they should go out there and do that job. And I think that is a, a major problem in our society. Unemployment is a major challenge. What I would like to do, I would like to do an unemployment drive. The statistics has been showing um, with the Department of Work, or before that, Department of um, Employment and Labor, has not been a true transcript of our unemployment because the system has failed and most of them are frustrated, do not want to register. So my job is to bring awareness and bring a, a um, employment drive in Georgetown West so they can get those persons um, registered and work hand in hand with the Department of Work to make sure that they are registered in the system and given opportunities. Thank you. Ms. McGull Lumsden. If I had to identify two top issues that our youth are feel, facing, I have several young people in my family. And I think what continues to be of huge concern is that of mental illness. And mental, mental illness is not just amongst the youth. I think it's in Cayman in general, and it's pretty rampant. And what we need to do, honestly, is remove the stigma that's attached to mental illness. There's so many persons that are suffering from mental illness. But because there's a stigma, they don't seek the help that is required. In addition to that, how do we do that? We bring awareness to the situation or to the illness of mental illness. That's as simple as we can get when it comes to young people. We have young people that are thinking about suicide. We have young people that are depressed, who's, uh, who's suffering from anxiety. There is a significant amount of, amounts of, um, amount of youth that is, is suffering from mental illness. So that's first and foremost. And in addition to that, unemployment is huge amongst the youth. What do we do there? As previously mentioned, what we need to do is continue to upskill and empower our Caymanian youth. I think once we try to think and empower them and push up skilling and let them know there's so many other resources that can be lended to them, such as technical and vocational training centers, that can help with their upskilling and obviously assist when it comes to jobs. That's an avenue that I hope to explore. That's an avenue that I think that is required at this time and more resources need to go into technical and voc vocational training so that we can continue to upskill our young Caymanians and get them into jobs. Thank you. Thank the candidates. We've gone through 17 questions, so well done. Now what we're gonna do is gonna take a short commercial break and when we return, each candidate will deliver a close their closing remarks. So please stay tuned. Behind everything we do is a promise. Better. Better because we care. Because we all have a common goal. To be better at cooking. To be better at eating right. And taking care of ourselves. To live in a better community. To just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Georgetown West. We've reached the stage in the evening where we have closing remarks from each of our candidates. We're going to begin with the lady on the panel, Perlina McGaugh-Lumsden. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. And for the good people of Georgetown West, I implore you during this election cycle that we make a change within government. Make no mistake about it. We are at a crossroads when it comes to the Cayman Islands. Why are we here? That is a very profound question. Because simply put, we have a government that just do not care about ordinary citizens. Who are the ordinary citizens? People like you and me that are Caymanians. We have an environmental crisis. We have a housing crisis. We have a traffic crisis. We have a health care crisis. We have a cost of living crisis. We have an unemployment crisis. And what is the government sound of the day during this election cycle? Their COVID success. COVID is a success because of people like you and I. So I implore you, do not buy what they are selling. It is as simple as that. We need to elect leaders, to elect individuals that will stand up for ordinary citizens in this country. We need to continue. And as your MP, I will continue to enrich and look to enrich Caymanian lives. And, and I will not pay attention to the special interest group which this government has done. I am seeking you to trust me with your vote come April 14th so that I can make a difference in your life and in your family, lives, family life. I thank you so much to the Chamber for having us, the good people of Georgetown West, for allowing me into your humble abode. Your stories will not go unnoticed and it will not fall on deaf ears. I promise to be a true representative when it comes to the people of Georgetown West and the people of the Cayman Islands. I thank you, good night, and God bless us in the Cayman Islands. Mr. Elio Solomon. Yeah. Again, speaking specifically to the people in Georgetown West, I would like to say that what you've actually been able to hear here tonight is the fact that a lot of these issues that you're hearing now, you have been hearing last election and the election before. You've heard about it for decades. And many of these problems have not been addressed. And if we're honest with ourselves, here's what we're going to know. And if you listen to what the, the previous premier has said, he's made it clear that even in terms of your representative today, Mr. David White, he said he had to twist his arm to get him into office. You don't need a representative that you have to twist his arm. And David is a nice guy, and I want to stress that. And I'm going to stress about it because it's very important. He is a nice guy. But I had a lady who called me just this morning. She said she's 65 years of age. She was trying to contact the same representative, got no response. But here's the key important thing. Not only did she and all of us pay $576,000 to have that representative, but she's also lost four years of her life. She was six to one. If you lose another four years of her life, she'll be 69. You can't continue that. You actually have to make a change. You have to make that change for you. You have to make it for your family. Let me stress something. If you were going to go out tomorrow and choose something as simplistic as a Tyler, you would choose a Tyler by asking your friends, do you know a Tyler? And if they simply mention a name, you wouldn't stop there. You'd ask them, do you have, did he do any work for you? And it's only when you are satisfied that he's done work for someone and he's done a quality job, will you actually go ahead and hire that Tyler? Well, then if you do that with something as simple as your Tyler, why would you do anything less with your representative? You have to choose a representative that at the end of the day has the experience and has the proven results that they can actually deliver. And in this case, you need someone that's going to be able to deliver on housing, and I've done that. Someone that can deliver and create the issues about cost of living, like providing those deposits like I did with the pension, and I've done that. And I want to stress as well, I have a lovely family. I have three daughters. My youngest one is handicapped, and I stress that as well because for those ladies out there who are concerned about female issues, I can assure you those three ladies will keep me in check as well. So I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, on April the 14th to please give me a chance to actually serve you, the people of Georgetown West. And I promise that just like I did between 2009 and 2013 as a humble backbencher, I will do just as much or more if I'm given your vote on April the 14th. Thank you very much and God bless all of you. Mr. Kendrick Webster. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to um, thank um, the President, um, uh, Mr. Gibbs, um, Vice President, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Will, and the entire Chamber family um, for providing such a mind-provoking 
and engaging forum for all of us candidates across the Cayman Islands for the last few months. I also want to thank the sponsors, Fossils Wood Fair, the Dart Group, Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate Services, and not last and what not least, the media. But most of all, I would like to thank the listeners across the Cayman Islands for engaging in this evening's forum. I trust that you understand the emerging challenges of governing these islands. Above all, you, the people of Georgetown West, have given me an extraordinary experience by visiting your homes. I've experienced those challenges that you have, and I will address those once I'm elected as your MP. There is no one way to lead, but including you, the people of Georgetown West, will make this journey much lighter for me. For the past few months, you have heard from other candidates in Georgetown West. You can see that for the past four years, there has been little or nothing done by the current incumbent in Georgetown West. I have a different vision for Georgetown West and the wider Cayman Islands community that benefits economic growth, a much better education system, and affordable health care. Georgetown West, you deserve the best. If you give me the opportunity to be your MP, I will always listen to you and be your voice. I will fight each and every day for you and your families. I, will, I know that you had many broken promises, and that is why I have made a pledge into my manifesto that I will return to the community on a regular basis. My word is my bond. That is what I live by. So I ask for your humble vote on April 14th. Vote for a candidate who has a proven track record, a candidate that cares about his community. At this point in time, and where we're positioning the Cayman Islands, we need persons that are going to represent you, that truly cares from their heart. And that representative is no other than yours truly, Kenrick Webster. So on April 14th, vote number three, vote Webster. May God bless you, and may God continue to richly bless these Cayman Islands. I'd now like to turn over the proceedings to the President of the Chamber, Mike Gibbs, with some closing remarks. Thank you, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to thank the Georgetown West candidates, Perlina McGaw Lumsden, Elio Solomon, and Kenrick Webster, for participating in this evening's forum. I trust that the forum will help the voters in that constituency to determine who to vote for when you go to the polls on April the 14th. I would also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship of Chambers Candidate Forums, as well as Affinity Recruitment, Bodens Legal and Corporate, and DART. If you're interested in viewing more of the Growth Matters video series that have been playing during tonight's commercial breaks, they can be accessed at growthmatters.ky. Please join us next Tuesday evening, the 6th of April, as we welcome Richard Bernard, Emily Ducou, Frank Whitfield, Roy McTaggart, and Christina Rowlandson from Georgetown East. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the Easter break. Good night. <laughs>